So I've been riding the Five Nights at Freddy's Theory Train for quite some time. Hard to believe that the whole thing's been going on for over five years now. Five whole years of theorizing, and yet we still haven't come up with an answer to one of the series' oldest questions. Who is the phone guy? It's a question that's been bothering this community for quite some time because so far no one has been able to attach a name to this faceless voice over the phone. Because when it comes to Five Nights at Freddy's, often the response to not being able to solve a mystery in one game is to wait for the next one in hopes of it having the necessary evidence. But luckily for us, we don't actually have to wait until Five Nights at Freddy's 57 Freddy in Space to come out for the evidence we need to answer this question. I kid you not, all of the evidence we need to conclude this convoluted conundrum is right there in the first two games. So let's just jump right into it. To recap, in Five Nights 1, the phone guy is a man who leaves you messages over the phone for you to listen to while you work, providing you with instructions, advice, etc. until you witness his death at the hands of the animatronics on the other end. Yeah, I, I, I always wondered what was in all those empty heads back there. You know. Oh no. This is an important moment because it means the phone guy was dead since before the beginning of the game. Not only reconfirming that his words were being presented through pre-recorded messages, but also showing that his tapes were being played over the phone by someone else, without the phone guy's say-so. From this we learn that A, phone guy's messages are pre-recorded, and B, someone else is putting them on. Got all that? Cool. Now let's apply what we've learned to Five Nights 2. In the second game, you take control of Jeremy Fitzgerald in a different location during November of 1987, and just like the first game, you're instructed by you-know-who via pre-recorded messages playing over the phone. However, unlike the first game, these messages being played aren't actually for you, they're for someone else. Because during night one, Phone Guy welcomes you to your new summer job. Uh, hello and welcome to your new summer job at the new and improved Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. But if you'll recall, this game takes place in November, which is nowhere near close to being considered a summer month. But that's not all, because at the beginning of the game, the newspaper clipping with the job application reads Grand Reopening which can only mean that the location was open before, but was then closed down and is now opening again. This explains why Phone Guy said summer job, because when he originally recorded that tape, it was summer. But then the place closed down for a few months before reopening in November, with someone else putting on the old tapes despite them being slightly out of date. This piece of evidence is monumentally important, because it means that everything Phone Guy went over in his tapes were actually meant for the night guard who worked at this location before it closed down, who we know exists because the pink slip that Fritz Smith got at the end of Custom Night reads employee number three, which would make Jeremy employee number two, and whoever this first guy was employee number one. And when we take all of Phone Guy's dialogue in this game as being intended for this mysterious employee number one and not ourselves, it actually reveals quite the bombshell. Because during night six, Phone Guy comes on and says this. Uh, when the plane eventually opens again, I'll probably take a night shift myself. So if this line is referring to when the location closed down the first time, and Phone Guy is saying that he'll take the night shift himself when the place reopens, then that means that the true identity of the Phone Guy is Jeremy Fitzgerald. When the game starts, it's the grand reopening, as shown in the paper. On night six, Phone Guy says he'll take on the night shift himself when the place reopens. And when it does, who steps up to take the job as night guard? That's right, Jeremy. And what also makes Jeremy in particular an interesting case is that he's the only named night guard who doesn't get fired. Mike Schmidt was released for tampering with the animatronics at the end of Custom Night, and Fritz Smith gets terminated for the same thing. Meanwhile, Jeremy gets through all six nights without any injury or request for removal. And likewise, in the first game, when Phone Guy says, um, I actually worked in that office before you. I'm finishing up my last week now, as a matter of fact. It's implied that he's been working this job for quite some time and has been a model employee throughout, working this job until he's able to quit or retire. But wait a minute, wasn't Jeremy moved to day shift? How could he still have the night shift job by Five Nights One? Easy. Jeremy wasn't moved to day shift. Employee number one was. Messages were meant for him, not Jeremy, meaning that he was the one moved to day shift. But wait, 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 well, what about the tapes? Why would Jeremy put on his own tapes to listen to during the second game? Simple, he isn't. Remember that all of Phone Guy's tapes are pre-recorded messages. Because the Phone Guy was dead since before night one in the first game, that means that someone else was putting his tapes on for you to listen to. And the same is true for Five Nights 2. Someone else was putting the tapes on. And believe it or not, but Jeremy and Phone Guy being the same person actually explains why he has to listen to his own tapes. If Phone Guy was courteous enough to call employee number one every night of his shift, then don't you think he would do the same thing for any future employees like he does for Mike? If Jeremy is listening to these old tapes not intended for him, then that can only mean that Phone Guy can't personally call Jeremy on the phone like he did with employee number one and Mike Schmidt, most likely because they are indeed one and the same. But maybe it's all a stretch. Maybe I'm just crazy and the original theory that Jeremy's the Bite of 87 victim is correct.
Except for one thing. You see, at the end of Pizzeria Simulator, we're shown an assortment of gravestones, one of which belongs to Jeremy, and it's commonly believed that he died after losing his frontal lobe to the bite of 87. However, in Five Nights One, Phone Guy remarks on how the human body can live without the frontal lobe, implying that the victim actually survived the incident. But then there was the bite of 87. Yeah. It's amazing that the human body can live without the frontal lobe. No. Which means that the bite can't be Jeremy's true cause of death, if he were the victim. And assuming that he didn't die of old age or some jazz, then what killed him? Well, if you'll recall, on night four in the first game, we hear Phone Guy die over the phone. And if the two truly are one and the same, then this is Jeremy's death as well. And the reason why that gravestone is there. It's the only logical explanation for how Jeremy died. No matter which way you slice it, all the evidence points to Jeremy Fitzgerald being the Phone Guy himself. A character whose true identity has remained a mystery to even this community's most esteemed theorists. And so now that we've cracked the caper, we can finally close the book on these games for at least a little while. Or not. There's actually one issue. On night one of Five Nights 2, Phone Guy says, You're only the second guard to work at that location. Uh, the first guy finished his week, but complained about conditions. Uh, we switched him over to day shift. So, hey, lucky you, right? Which calls into question the evidence of Fritz Smith being employee number three. So if the tapes were originally meant for employee number one, then does that mean that there was a night guard before the first night guard? Does the tally of night guards carry over from before the restaurant's closure? And this newspaper clipping says a few weeks, does that mean weeks since the reopening or in total? This could possibly complicate the theory. My best guess is that this employee number zero was actually the purple guy, since it's implied that it's his fault for causing the investigation that got the restaurant closed down, and that he's been fired because of it, leaving a spot open for day shift. Especially concerning any previous employees. Um, when we get it all sorted out, we may move into the day shift. So this one just became available. So maybe Fazbear Entertainment struck him from the record to keep future employees in the dark about the company's ties to the incident? Maybe. Or maybe these games just make no goddamn sense. <laughs>